decided to put the uh, okay, it's all right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Where? Right? And, uh, it's okay. Where was that? No, no, I was thinking it would be I can. No, no, no. I thought side study would be there. Never mind. The youngest would be there. That's it. Um, can the crew get the rest of the guests into the hall now, please? We will start in two minutes. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could uh, settle down and if you could close the, the door. May I ask, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, please rise for our national anthem.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please have a seat. Let me, well, first of all, very welcome. Good evening. Selamat sejahtera. Salam Malaysia. And, of course, a selamat hari raya to all our Muslim friends. My name is Johnson Chong, and I'm the Executive Director of Malaysian, Malaysiana LCMS, and we are organizing this together with Leaderonomics. First of all, let me thank everyone for taking the time to attend, especially our physical audience here. But of course, we are also live streaming this event right now. So hello to the audience online. Thank you for joining us. Um, I think it's very obvious to everyone, and I think uh, that's the reason you're here. We have a very special lineup of speakers and panelists to discuss a rather important topic at this time of our country's progress, if we can call it that. Well, the, the reason why we decided to organize this forum, this book forum as we call it, is we believe that uh, we need to encourage a public discourse on, important, on this important matter of parliamentary reforms, which uh, thanks to Tan Sri Arif Yusof, He's written a book about it, and I thought that, would, that is the perfect opportunity for us to invite this esteemed uh, panel to come together to discuss this topic that we've chosen, that is, uh, does ha Parliament hold the key to reforms? Now, um, I don't know if, who has read the book, can I ask? Ah, there are a few who have already got it well in advance and have read it. And those who have read would know that uh, Tan Sri Arif has raised many good questions, especially in the chapter entitled, In Closing, that is the final chapter, um, which, like I mentioned just now, gave us the perfect opportunity to have the panel discussion in conjunction with this forum. Now, uh, I must say, we have very short time tonight because uh, we wanted to respect the prayer times and as well as the shopping center is closing at 10 o'clock. Um, so we will keep, try to keep a very tight schedule, right? Um, but if you would indulge us, we might go over time a little bit, maybe by about 15 minutes. And for those of you who are wondering, you can get your book signed by Tan Sri Arif after the event. There will be a special book signing um, session. Okay, um, before we start, let me do a little bit of advertisements. One, I think you might have seen or you will have seen the book sales counter in front. If you haven't got a copy of the books, you can still get it. I hope it's not run out yet. Okay, and number two, this is a little bit of a delicate subject, but uh, it is my duty to, to do it. Um, book sales in Malaysia, I don't know whether you're aware, they don't shoot off the roof like in America, right? Uh, in America, for a bestseller, you're talking about a million copies. In Malaysia, when you sell 3,000 copies, it's already a bestseller but that is not going to cover the cost of an event like this. So I must say, even at this point, I would like to thank some anonymous sponsors, friends who have donated, but if you could, we would really appreciate your generous contribution as well. You might have seen some uh, donation boxes. Of course, you don't need to do that now. I'll remind you later, okay? So now, without further ado, let me introduce um, the first speaker of the night which is Tan Sri Arif Yusuf. I'm sure you all know um, he was the former speaker of our Dewan Rakyat, was appointed by the Pakatan Harapan government in 2018, but uh, unfortunately a very short stint and he had to, uh, well, I don't know how to put the right word, step aside or step down in uh, 2020, right? Um, now, just for the, maybe the lawyers or the, uh, the 
members of parliament. You, you might find it interesting to know as well, this is not the only book that is written. He's also written a book called The Malaysian Erskine May, which is the parliamentary practice handbook, right? So he doesn't only write uh, this sort of books, he writes technical books as well. Um, and I don't know if um, some of you are aware, but he was also one of our Court of Appeal judges way back when, right? And now he's gone back to um, being a consultant in one of the leading legal firms in Kuala Lumpur. Now, um, I just want to say this very quickly. Personally, I have not known Tan Sri Arif for very long, but it's very obvious to me in my short interactions and from the support that his friends have shown in coming for his events, it's very obvious he's a good man and much respected. And I think let's give him a round of applause. And this mic is yours, Tan Sri. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera to everyone. And uh, following from what Johnson said just now, I also wish to uh, wish everyone Selamat Hari Raya. We're still within the Hari Raya period. Um, I wish to, first of all, by way of introduction, thank Johnson and Malaysiana LCMS and Literonomics.com for organizing uh, this event. This is my second physical event. I'm so glad we can have physical events now after the lockdown. Um, just a few days ago, I was in Penang at the Penang Institute. Um, it was a good turnout, and we had very searching questions directed at me. Uh, and others. I was there with uh, Stephen Sim, um, and we had a kind of good um, session with everyone in Penang. So today I'm very glad to have this physical event in Kuala Lumpur. So we're back to the source, Kuala Lumpur. And I'm very happy also to see my good friend, Dan Sri Buner, who's here. And of course, all the YBs, uh, so it's Sadiq and Hani Yo and Ambiga, who's also here. Ambiga is a very strong supporter of the reform movement. And uh, if you have questions which are difficult enough, you can direct to Ambiga and not to me. And she'll be more than happy, I think, to, to answer. Um, most of the persons you see on, on stage do figure in my book. Yeah? Some are named, like uh, Said Sadiq. I have uh, referred to him uh, quite a number of times, yeah? Hannah Yo, I'm not sure whether I have referred expressly uh, by name. Ambiga, I have not referred to expressly by name, but take it from me. Uh, there's a main character there, which is Ambiga. You know? So we leave it at that. Yeah? Um, why have I chosen to write this book, you may ask? Yeah? And as Johnson said just now, this is not the first book I've written. Yeah? Um, this relatively little book called Parliament Unexpected is actually written by me and my son. It's co-authored by Lutfi Hakim. I don't know whether he's here or he's perhaps on the way here. Uh, Lutfi, are you here? No, he's on the way. Uh, but he'll be here. Um, this is sort of the, 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 the last in the series of books. You, you know, the first book, not written by me, but I had a hand in it, is this one. 
Malaysian Parliamentary Procedure, a guide to the standing orders of the Dewan Rakyat. Okay, this is the first one that um, I encourage um, its publication. Uh, this is by Monique Smith and Maha Balakrishnan. Yeah. Uh, it is a very good book. We gave it out for free. But sadly, uh, I don't think there were many takers from amongst the MPs. It's a common story. So anyway, after that little book, um, I then graduated to this big book, of which I'm very proud. It was mentioned by Johnson just now. But this is not wholly my book. One third of it is mine. I was a general editor. Um, but this is the Malaysian Erskine May. Uh, it took a long time to write this book, uh, about two years from inception to its final publication. But um, as I said in Penang, this is not a book I would recommend to friends. It's a very heavy book. <laughs> um, but if you are interested, if you're a serious researcher or reader, uh, you can purchase it if it's still available. Uh, um, and it will give you some of the answers that uh, you want to any particular problem uh, arising in the parliamentary system. If not the answers, at least pointers to some of the answers. This book is actually the book that impelled me to write this book, Parliament Unexpected. Why? In this big book, in the conclusion, I narrated you know, the Sheraton move and the fall of the Pakatan Harapan government and the inside story, not the entire inside story, but the inside story so far is the facts, parliament. And there was one member of the audience who said, I, I found it riveting, she said, because much of the stuff that I included in the conclusion were, were not available yet at that time. Of course, nowadays we've got so many people writing on it. Um, that is part of the problem. We're still piecing the jigsaw together. Huh? Yeah, little, little bits of pieces here and there. Uh, Tun Mahade has written his account. Uh, uh, Marina Mahade has written her account. Uh, who else? Uh, it's this guy Kombos who's written his account. Yeah? Um, and Matsabu also has written his account. Tommy Thomas has written his account. And uh, who else? Uh, Lim Kei Chiang and Lim Jin Tong have also narrated their accounts of what happened. But there is as yet nothing so complete as to supply all the answers that we want. There are so many questions uh, which still arise. And, uh, you can't get it from me because I was not a direct participant. Yeah? I was a participant, but within the confines of the Dewan Rakyat, where it affected me. And I said in the book, I had to make some very difficult decisions, but um, I have also said in the book, um, I was not a front row particip uh, participant in the entire uh, Sheraton Move concept. Anyway, Sheraton move has come and gone. Um, it's a little bit dated at the moment, I think. Yeah. But many of the problems raised by this move called the Sheraton move uh, are still with us. As we speak, as we discuss, uh, the long shadow of the Sheraton move is still with us. Okay? And therefore, when I wrote this book, I had all these at the back of my mind. Yeah? But mind you, this book um, is not a memoir. I've stated a number of times, eh? it is not a memoir. I did not set out to write a memoir. Tommy Thomas has written a memoir, you know, it's a very long book. Eh? Um, but I've not written a memoir. Um, if you still want to regard it as some kind of memoir. Uh, there are only about two pages <laughs> uh, devoted to my life story. Very, very brief, two pages, and uh, a few black and white photographs, uh, just to add spice to, to the book, eh? to make it more interesting. Because as he said in Alice in Wonderland, whatever, uh, Alice said, what is a book without pictures? I've included some pictures there. Eh? But those pictures will also show you 
the sequence of events that led to my ouster or removal or vacation. Well, that's a technical term they use. So it tells a story. It tells a parliamentary story um, during my time as Speaker of the House. It is a record, in fact, of the major events in the Dewan Rakyat uh, during my term as Speaker. I have tried to portray a fair picture to the best that I could uh, of these events, which ended, of course, as you know, with my removal following that Sheraton move. What is the third point that, you know, that comes out from the book? It is not an academic text. Um, if you want an academic text, read the Malaysian Askin Me. But this book is more a narration of some kind of a parliamentary story told in very simple language without unnecessary legalese. But of course, we can't avoid legalese, but I've tried to distill the concepts behind the law uh, to make it simple. I write for the common man, and I would like to think for the common man, from a common man. Uh, there are no pretensions in this, in this book. Uh, I've written in simplicity so that the reader can make sense what has happened in Parliament and is still happening in Parliament. The book is full of anecdotes. Uh, this is the part, if I may say so. I, I'm, I felt you know, quite, quite driven to... to, to writing this book with a lot of anecdotes uh, within its pages because it's pointless to write an academic, academic text uh, and very few people will appreciate it. But once I have the anecdotes uh, within the pages, you will understand what is it that has gone wrong in our parliament and in our system of governance. I have made liberal use of the Hansard, uh, made references to good and also roguish MPs, yeah? I um, don't want to name names. I have avoided the gossipy aspects of, of the matter. But um, where you have terrible behaviour, I have noted, that, noted this behaviour in the book. Right? That people swearing a four-letter word, you know, sort of thing. It has to be put down on record. Because people forget. MPs forget. You know, I don't know how many MPs have got the book and have read the book. Uh, have not read the book. Well, they don't care. Yeah? Uh, same thing with this. The, all the effort that we took, not only my effort, very few MPs bother to read it. I think the assumption is once you are an MP, especially if you're <laughs> from a particular block, you know all that needs to know. Yeah? So, but I can't say this for my Pakatan Harapan friends. Many of them have bought this book. I know. Yeah? So it's, I think it's got multiple copies, I think. Three copies. There you are. Three <laughs> uh, ones. So they, they do read the book. Yeah? One member from the ruling uh, opposition, very senior member, uh, still came up to me one day and said, I have got your book, I have read it, I have quoted uh, some sections in the book. Yeah? So at least I have one supporter amongst the PN or BN or BN Plus or whatever yeah, you can call them now. Now, even though I have included Hansard and made comments and picked, up, picked out examples of this uh, thuggish behaviour, I have avoided you know, being drawn into the gossipy aspects. Eh? So if you're looking for gossip and scandalous stories, uh, the book has got none, eh? unfortunately. Eh? So it's a blow-by-blow -blow account of the major events, um, and I hope for, for the reader who reads it, you'll find it uh, gripping enough without the, the scandalous yeah, stories. Where I can disclose, I have disclosed. Where I cannot disclose, I have not disclosed. So I, I don't uh, like you know, scandalizing in the stories and uh, not respecting confidentiality. Right? Now, there is a fourth point. I think we're going on to the fourth point. This is a book that is uh, a book that does not merely tell a story, uh, the parliamentary story, but it attempts to tie the strands um, within the story to answer some very critical questions, as Johnson uh, alluded to earlier. 
the oft, often asked question, what is wrong with our parliament? What is fundamentally, fundamentally wrong with Malaysian politics? And where do we go from here? These are some of the questions I have raised in the book. Uh, perhaps I've not supplied the complete answers, um, but my idea is to highlight all these questions, and I would particularly invite the reader to read and contemplate the contents um, in this regard, um, particularly what you will find in the introduction and the last chapter headed in closing. I spent a bit of time with uh, Lotfi and one other editor uh, trying to give a suitable heading to the last chapter. Uh, we started off by having it as is usual, as uh, an epilogue. We have an introduction, we have an epilogue. But when we discussed among ourselves, we thought that is not a good idea because the story has not ended. The story is perhaps just beginning. So finally, we decided to call it in closing so that the narrative can be continued by you and I. Um, given the limited time, I think we'd better reserve some of the other comments uh, for question and answers later. But what I would like to do is to set the scope of this forum um, really in place. I would like to read some parts of the closing chapter, particularly on reforms. Eh? If you read on, from page 282 onwards, um, headed reforms and uh, beyond, I have said this. I think I'm still doing time. I'll just read this and I'll close. Eh? This book has spent a considerable amount of time discussing Parliament's rules and practices in the hope that it would provide some clarity over how they operate and how they can be improved. As I argued earlier, without reforming Parliament, there is little hope to regain the ever elusive trust of the Rakyat in their elective representative. These rules and the legal frameworks that enable them are akin to a computer's operating system. It may be filled with features and can perform incredible tasks, but ultimately it depends on the motivations and knowledge of the user. They may require drastic updating, but Parliament's standing orders provide a framework for orderly and efficient conduct that should allow MPs to debate and deliberate over important issues of the day for the sake of the rakyat. It is hoped that by creating greater awareness of the rules that already exist, people will be able to better understand how parliament functions today and what can be done to improve it. And this part, I feel, is important, what follows. What is more difficult by magnitudes is the wider work that needs to be done to move our voting public to a greater appreciation of the functions of democracy and participating in it. There needs to be an effort to reverse multiple generations' worth of official and unofficial indoctrination and reconstitute our understanding of what it means to be a member of Malaysian society. People need to move beyond using laws and policy as a means towards advancing each person's narrow interests and start thinking of the purposes and intents of lawmaking to create a better society. This is the foundational work that needs to be done the cultural support that I alluded to earlier in an earlier chapter. It is no longer enough to vote. We must also demand more from the democratic system itself. This is why parliamentary reforms matter, to bring it to within the scope of the forum. This is why parliamentary reforms matter, but they are only one tool in a suite of changes that we need for Malaysia. Our rules, and culture must keep up with the times and demands of a more diverse and sophisticated population and counterweight destructive political impulses which would put the purpose of parliament out of whack. The points that I have raised in the book are not only to discuss the possible current interpretations and applications, but they also serve to highlight the areas where restoration, enough, uh, restoration alone is not enough and a review, at the very least, and serious reform need to take place. The space for intelligent, honest, and effective deliberation 
must be protected at minimum or expanded. The law cannot prevent incompetent and indolent individuals from assuming public office. Very often we're seeing this as we speak. We are seeing one other instance. But the structures of power, civil society, public parties, media, clergy, etc., etc., can influence who gains prominence. If capable, right-thinking relations avoid participation and remain on the sidelines, then the entire country will continue to be at the mercy of those who are least deserving of those positions. Let me end by quoting the last three uh, paragraphs, and then I will end this short introduction. Thinking through these questions will require me to write a different book than what is in the reader's hands. It is also a story that needs to be written by the millions of Malaysians from whom the nation draws its sovereignty by demanding, working, and organizing for change. The post-pandemic digital, uh, post digital age that we live in will require us to find new ways of performing and protecting our democracy, and it starts by understanding and appreciating the roles of our institution of government. I hope that my humble effort in demystifying parliament and the legislative process through this book has been, uh, has been able to be of some assistance. And then I concluded, the story began long before our present day tribulations, written in sweat, tears and hope by successive waves of individuals and communities that wanted to realize a fairer, kinder, more equitable tanah air for themselves and their communities. I believe that story has not ended and we must write it again together. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tan Sri. And particularly, thank you for quoting those passages towards the end. I hope the panelists were listening because actually <laughs> I have a few questions based on that to, to ask you later on. Um, I've actually, Tan Sri has copies of the book for everybody. I'm just getting them passed up to stage. I'll hand you a copy afterwards whilst uh, Tan Sri Munir is uh, giving his speech. Now, let me very quickly um, introduce Tan Sri. And by the way, I'm keeping the introductions very short and sorry about the informalities that I uh, didn't address the, the VIPs, but uh, I, I tend to be you know, very people-centric that way. Um, okay, so Tan Sri, Dr. Munir Majid, actually, um, I know him list. I've never met him before. Today was the first time, actually. I've met all the others. Um, so, in fact, I was just thinking this morning, he is the odd one out on stage. Uh, why do I say that? Because he does not have a direct link to politics, as far as I'm concerned. But I'm sure he's had brushes with some politicians before, and I, I think he might uh, tell you some stories about that in private. Um, but um, what I found very fascinating, if you look at the book, um, uh, Tan Sri Mune, he wrote the afterword. And he was simply described as visiting senior fellow of LSE Ideas, that is the Center for International Affairs, Diplomacy and Strategy. But for those who don't know, Tan Sri Dr. Mune Majid is a highly accomplished Malaysian. He was, amongst other things, the former group editor of New Straits Times, first executive chairman of CIMB, and the founding chairman of the Malaysian Securities Commission. But I think for to, to, tonight's uh, occasion, most importantly, he is a personal friend of the author, and I think uh, I will be asking him some questions about what he wrote in the afterword. But for now, let us invite uh, Tan Sri Dr. Munir Majid to take the mic. Mm. Very good evening, everyone. Salam sejahtera. 
and uh, it is still Shawal, I believe, and so Salam Idil Fitri to the Muslims uh, amount you, among you. I'd like to thank, of course, uh, Johnson Chong for, and the organizers for inviting me to speak uh, this evening, uh, and of course to speak uh, about uh, Tantri Arif's uh, parliament uh, unexpected, and in the process uh, to discuss uh, the book in the context, particularly of the question, is parliament the key to reforms in Malaysia? Now let me begin by, in turn, asking this. If parliament is representative of the toxic politics of Malaysia, what hope is there for reform? Not even parliamentary reform. What more reform in the way the country is run, which is now based on race, religion, and illicit reward, resulting in a national structure that can only support suboptimality at best. Now, this is happening when global competitive challenges are mounting and increasing in complexity. It's a long question, but I think it's a question we must ask ourselves. Now, on the other hand, if we cannot rely on Parliament to take the small steps of reform, there would be no hope to bring positive change to the Malaysian political system, even incrementally. Now, members of parliament are the people's representatives. Can they be made to further the people's interests instead of those of their political parties and, indeed, of themselves? Can they find common ground in parliament and not bring to it the deep divisions and polarized nature of political affiliation and contestation to the assembly of the people. Now, in Parliament Unexpected, Arif expresses the hope implicitly, however forlorn, that through better appreciation and discharge of its duties and responsibilities, Parliament can make an essential contribution not only to arrest the decline of values in the political process, but even to achieve, to begin a turnaround. Now, the three eminent panelists this evening have been and are in the good fight in the course of a better Malaysia. Like Arif, they are all in it for the good of Malaysia, yet Arif was cut down in unceremonious fashion despite being an impartial and objective speaker of the Dewan Raya, to be replaced by someone more malleable. Now, in my afterword in Arif's book, I was less reticent than Arif himself on the way the Muyidin government treated him, and very importantly, of Muyudin's contemptuous disregard of parliament, a black immorality in the history of parliamentary democracy in Malaysia. Now, whether or not it is illegal for a prime minister never to have been endorsed by parliament, I leave it to constitutional experts to discern. Perhaps in a new edition of law, principles, and practice in the Dewan Rakyat, which Arif himself had edited when he was speaker in celebration, as he said, of 60 years of Malaysian parliament, which first was founded and started in 1959. Now, in that book, Principles Practice, Dato Ambiga, one of the panelists this evening, made a contribution on the concept of caretaker government. Perhaps in a new edition, 
a contribution might be made on whether there is such a thing as interim prime minister in the federal constitution. One to vote that could have been, been given permanence had an emergency been declared at the material time. You will recall the interim prime minister's request for a sitting of parliament under standing order 11.3 of the Dewan Rayat to discover, but not stated in the request, who had majority support in parliament to be prime minister at a time when the Agong was busy considering who might that person be. While it is not likely that there would have been two prime ministers, but what is not improbable could be that the one chosen by the Agong might have been the one not endorsed by parliament. A possible constitutional crisis. This was averted by speakers, uh, Speaker Arif's fastidious interpretation of requirement of specific purpose to be stated in any request under Standing Order 11.3. Now, this is political wisdom after thought. Huh? But in the event, however, Parliament never got to demonstrate its support for the Prime Minister picked by the King. The process is the King picks him, then he's endorsed in Parliament. This did not happen. He was just picked and he avoided Parliament for a long, long time. Now, these heady events uh, that I describe are events of the end of February, early March 2020. And you remember at that time, COVID took grip as the politicians were busy, busying themselves about who was going to take power. But anyway, it saw a change of government reflecting return to the status quo ante after the threat, I use the threat in inverted commas, of Pakatan Harapan reforms, I use reforms also in inverted commas, after this threat was seen off. All this happened outside the purview of parliament. The promise of reform by Pakatan Harapan government and two of our panelists this evening Ms. Hannah Yeo and Said Sadiq, who are members of that administration, was, in my view, in any case, a chimera. It would be obviously interesting to hear what they have to say about this promise of reform. I had a number of experiences with that administration, but just let me relate one. I saw in the so-called Economic Action Council how everyone was tiptoeing around the Prime Minister. Yes, sir, yes, sir, three bags full, sir. And you will remember, in the first two months of the Pakatan Harapan government, it was one-man rule, you know. This was gazetted, one-man rule. So it was rule de jure. It was one-man rule de jure. But afterwards, it was one-man rule de facto. Hmm? Concentration was on power and succession, not on the promise of reform for which Pakatan Harapan was elected. There was no political planning on how to execute the reforms. Absolutely essential, this political planning, given the Malay Muslim suspicion of those reforms. Instead, there was capitulation before a reaction against the purported reforms that played up all the worst features of racial politics. Indeed, there was a joining of forces with this reaction from within Pakatan Harapan. Betrayal is the word often used to describe the actions of the turncoats, but that assumes that there was at first true commitment. A true reflection would be there was never at all any such commitment among significant parties and members of Pakatan Harapan's coalition, starting with its leader. So the Pakatan Harapan government, the so-called commitment to reform, was in an absolutely precarious position right from the start because there was Musso 
dalam selimut. Hmm? So Parliament, the key to reforms in Malaysia, when a so-called reformist government actually did not have its heart in it, when there is not continuity in the initiatives of a speaker, which was related in Iris book, who wanted Parliament to just begin to play more meaningfully its rightful role in a parliamentary democracy. How, when those, how to do so? How to do so? When those who control Parliament would have it that they did not make that reform. When its members, members of Parliament, behave as the arm of the executive and not of the legislature. When those in power do not want the means of remaining in power disrupted by any institution, including parliament. Now, only with the emergence of reasonable political leadership that seeks common ground and recognizes the role of all the different institutions of government under the federal constitution will there be the possibility of this country, parliament included, walking in the right direction. Now I end by asking, and now is this too much to ask? Will it ever happen? It can only happen when we have political leadership, dominant political leadership, being more reasonable and open and looking to forge common ground, not the kind of announcements that we had recently, say, at the AMNO Assembly. Is that a forging of common ground? That's a call to war action hmm? that might divide the country even further or at least sustain the deep divisions in the country. And then members of parliament are elected, maybe coalition governments are formed, but will the members of parliament serve the country, the people, and not their interests or the interests of their parties? Hence, there's such slow progress in anti-hopping laws, such slow progress in uh, spending laws parliament, uh, in parliament. Why? Why? Because there is a desire to maintain a status quo in which parliament cannot play its vital role and be the key to reforms. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tan Sri. Um, well, we were hoping that Tan Sri would uh, help provide some answers, but it seems he's added some questions. Um, but then again, that's the whole point tonight. And I do hope uh, the members of the audience will join into a lively discussion session later. It's not just a Q&A, but it is a discussion amongst Malaysians. But we won't go to that yet. And this is how the format is going to go, because right now we're still sort of in the book forum section of the event. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to sit down and ask a couple of questions to uh, the two tantries about the book. Um, you will get a chance later on to ask questions about the book, but uh, it will be after the panel discussion. And the first few questions, I hope you'll be directing it towards the book, but then after that, to the uh, panel discussion as a whole. So for now, just uh, uh, Dr. Ambiga, YB, Hannah, and YB Saisadik, allow me to just uh, direct the questions to the two Tan Sri's. First. Yep. Okay. So, um, Tan Sri Arif, you've, like I said just now, you've raised a lot of questions, especially in, in closing. Right, and you concur just now. In fact, you, you noted that in, in that chapter. There are a lot of lessons to be learned. I'm, I'm referring to some of what you've said. Um, obviously, the government has lost the people's trust. 
But I think it's more than the government. It's also politicians have lost people's trust. Uh, no disrespect to, to uh, those here. I think uh, you all know where I'm coming from. Um, we have also uh, YB Teresa Koch in the audience. Now, what would you say, Tanshree, are the main parliamentary reforms that need to take place first? Uh, Tanshree, Arif. Uh, I wish the answer can be that simple. Yeah? Yeah. To me, the biggest problem is one of culture, parliamentary culture. You know? um, I have tried to change bits of it, but uh, I must say that uh, I didn't wholly succeed because of the toxic nature of uh, parliamentary proceedings, uh, which you can still see even today, despite your MOU and what, what have not. Yeah? Why is it so? It's the cultural rules, the cultural, the under, cultural underpinnings has somehow been lost over time. This is not to say that it was never uh, uh, present. It was during the initial stages. I think in one of the chapters I did say, you know, as students, we went to uh, Parliament of, of Malaysia then, very early days. Uh, we saw how the parliamentarians behave. Uh, they behave well, mm -hmm. yeah, despite, you know, the... Uh, the, the debates and the loud debates, whatever, but they behave well. But um, it later evolved into something akin to Pasamalam. Uh, that's a normal <laughs> description that we often hear. So I tried to change this through various means, no, notably to take some of the toxicity from the floor of the house into committees. Which is why if you ask me what should be done, my answer is strengthen the committee system. Strengthen the committee system. Um, I tried it by forming six committees, uh, special select committees to start with. Uh, it wasn't plain sailing. I mean, the minister and deputy minister who was here can attest to this. It took some persuasion. Um, initially, I was a bit disappointed. Oh, what was the problem? Yeah, I wanted to set up six committees, and cabinet took some time <laughs> to, to really agree with me. Uh, this is a problem in politics. Yeah? This is a problem in politics. When you are in power, you don't want to be controlled. <laughs> you see, you want free reign. And it continues and continues and continues over time. Let's arrest this problem. Let's make sure that politicians understand the need to have a strong committee system. After two years, I managed to set up 10 committees, special select committees, covering almost the entire area of uh, governmental activity. Um, but what happened? After the Sheraton moved, PN came in, they reversed everything. <laughs> you know? And we started back again from scratch. Uh, the committee system that you have today is a revamped committee system, but it's still not working. You know, why is it not working? Because there is no realization, no goodwill to make it work. When a person is summoned or invited to appear before a committee, you can quibble with words. Is he, is he being summoned or being invited? But the fact of the matter is, if you're looking at a good committee system, and everyone agrees that a good committee system exists to avoid the toxicity, when you say, please appear before the committee, you must appear. Um, I have stated it in the book, and there's more of it in the big book, about how this kind of disobedience can amount to contempt of parliament, for which there is a punishment. If you're interested, you look at uh, mm -hmm. Standing Order 80A, Right. Uh, it, is, it is there. People can be held in custody for defying parliament. The, the rules are there. Right. But the question is, are our politicians uh, playing by, agree to play by the game? Precisely, that's right. So, so, okay, it seems from your answer, you're saying that it is by setting up, the main reform is by setting up select committees. But even in your short two and a half years, 
you have seen that it actually doesn't work. And the question, I will pose this to the panelists later, right, is what then, right? Um, but before we go there, I want to also pick on something that you said in closing as well. You seem to say that the people have not objected strongly enough to the fall of the democratically elected PH government. You know, um, in, in years gone by, you've seen thousands, right, uh, tens of thousands go to the street um, you know, and the birthday and all that. And this is probably even a worse event than before. But what do you think caused the people to have this sense of acquiescence to this? Well, uh, so here I think I depart slightly from uh, Munir's position. Yeah? <laughs> uh, I think Pakatan Harapan started off well despite the initial problems. I've noted it in the book. Yeah? Uh, of course, there was tussle here and there among themselves. Even the, my, my election as speaker, my choice as speaker was also subject to all kinds of debates internally. I know, I know, but you know, I just kept quiet because I wanted to serve. Yeah? Um, but they, they overcome all this initial you know, tussle and came up with some very good proposals for reform. Yeah? which I think they would have been able to carry out, most, most of them, yeah? perhaps not all. It was too ambitious. And this is the thing said about Pakatan Arapa, overpromised, which is true. Yeah? I think they overpromised probably because they never thought they would win. You know, it is a nice book. For me, at least, in, in doing the parliamentary reform, I took the book out and I followed the book plus you know, the standards uh, in the Commonwealth to, to add to it. But it is a workable book, actually workable. And I have been, in, uh, been informed lately that uh, even in the area of public health reforms, things were moving, but they were all scuttled you know, by, by the Sheraton move. Of course, there were other points involving you know, IPCMC, and, and there you can see the politicking you know, reaching a crescendo. Eh? Some people within Pakatan Harapan were not in favor of it at all. Yeah? So it, would, it took a bit of time. And of course, you have the ISERT and the um, Rome uh, Treaty you know, uh, problems. But to me, looking at it uh, from, from where I stood, yeah, the promises could not be delivered and were misunderstood as non-delivery because the other side played up the Malay Muslim narrative. Right. Yeah, but that's not really um, well the point that I was trying to to get at. I think it's more about the reaction of the people seem to be so, you know, repressed. Is it because right at that time COVID nineteen happened, just like uh, Tanshree Mune said earlier, or is it because, in my mind at least, there is a very general lack of courage or that or rather the inverse, there is so much fear amongst the people to do something to take their own fate, their, the country's own fate, into their own hands. Or maybe as you were trying to talk about, is it because of a lack of strong leadership from the then government that fell, or I should say the PH, right? How, would you like to say something to that, uh, Tan Sri Muni? Oh, can you hear me? Now, I, I, would, I, would, I would divide the, the, the need for, for reform uh, in Parliament uh, uh, into three areas. I mean, the first would be, I would say, the strategic uh, uh, structural uh, kind of reforms uh, that would stop Parliament from becoming a circus, you know, people jumping from one party to the next, and people getting money from all sorts of, uh, you know, dubious uh, sources and getting money from poor jumping. So, uh, you know, like the political funding laws, uh, you know, the, the, the anti-hopping laws and so on. So that, that is one area, you know. Now, the second area where, where Parliament you know, can begin to play, then begin to play a better role is in terms of making the executive accountable. 
Now, making the executive accountable does not mean just jumping on them, you know, every time they say something, uh, you know, as they say in the UK, to, to propose nothing and oppose everything as opposition. But there are some detailed areas huh, in which uh, Parliament, through which, can make the executive accountable, particularly, I think, in respect of, uh, uh, say, statutory bodies uh, that have been set up, which uh, are audited hmm, by the Jabatan uh, Audit Negara. Yeah? But when these reports are tabled, hmm, the Jabatan Audit Negara's reports, uh, financial uh, uh, reports are tabled, it hardly t gets any notice you know, uh, in Parliament. Nobody painstakingly goes through it and, and uh, questions, one, the statutory body concerned, and two, Jabatan Audit Negara itself on the quality of the audit. So there are detailed ways, you know, these are detailed, boring, you know, you don't get, uh, uh, you don't get, but there must be, there must be this accountability. You know. Now, thirdly, which is the most difficult, the third area is to improve the quality of MPs. How do you do that? I mean, okay, I mean, right now we've been reading recently in the House of Commons, uh, Dato Ambega, about how, you know, people resign, step aside, you know. Uh, I mean, this guy is sort of accused of, of, of rape, uh, for example, and the police tell him, you get out of parliament and you don't set foot on, in parliament again until this very serious accusation against you is, is cleared. Right? And he, he does it, he does it. He does it. He's not allowed in. The sergeant at arms and people will stop him, you know, from, from getting there. And then there's a guy uh, who actually was convicted of rape. Huh? Uh, a 15-year-old boy that he raped. Hmm? And he had to resign. There's a by-election taking place. Now, here we are in Parliament, our Parliament. Hmm? I mean, your people sort of uh, wearing lovely suits and so on, uh, with super ties, you know. Must be a Giorgio Armani ties or something, you know, turning up, making speeches in Parliament, you know, as if nothing has happened, whereas they have been convicted. And parliamentarians not questioning this themselves. So the quality of people, you know, who, who are willing to, 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 to have, sh who are shameless, Ooh, unbelievable. So I think the quality of people has, uh, of, of uh, parliamentarians have increased. How do you increase it through a party system? Or you have it through uh, GIs, you know, coming to the fore uh, and, and so on. So you must just shake it up a bit to make parliament, you know, more, 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 if you like, more sexy and, 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 you know, less compliant. So did you say GI, as in Gerak Independent? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't okay. know how many of them will get in, but, you know. Right. Well, I, I believe uh, Siti or Ravi will say something later on. We'll give you a chance. Okay. I, I think I'll, I'll bring in the, the rest of the panel to the discussion. Uh, I think, if, in fact, you mentioned something very interesting. I would like to, uh, someone actually put up this point. Um, and it, it relates to uh, Saudara Sadiq. But before you all get into the ring, let me very quickly again introduce the panelists. It's not like they really need introduction. Um, I think, um, you know, Dato Ambiga, um, you know, has led the people's movement called Berse for clean, fair elections. and. Just now, I just found out that uh, from what Tansri Arif said about your contributions to some of the parliamentary um, you know, uh, laws as well. So, very relevant. Um, Hannah, I'm sorry, why be Hannah? I'm just, I've known Hannah for so many years. I'm so used to that. Um, in fact, she was the speaker of the Selangor State Legis Legislative Assembly. Right? Previously. So I'm sure there are certain things that you can uh, share with us or relate to on, on this topic as well. And of course, uh, Saeed Sadiq, um, the youngest minister ever. Um, not only that, a debater. And I think you can see the level of debate that, well, I don't know whether you can even call it that in parliament. So a very appropriate um, panel, I, I, I would say. Now, I would like to follow up on what Tan Sri Mune said just now about the quality of MPs. There's no question about it. I think we all know that, right? But someone has raised a question 
or a point in a, in a WhatsApp group, Malaysia First. I think some of you would have heard of that. Um, started by uh, Taufik Ismail, son of uh, Tun Dr. Ismail, one of our former deputy prime ministers. And he, he picked on this point exactly. The very fact that we invited uh, Saudara Said Sadiq to this forum because there is a case against him for corruption. Now, in a country like ours, we know how easily institutions, even the prosecution or MACC, can be used to start cases like that, right? So, how do we balance that? In fact, I, I was actually honestly very shocked when they compared the former Prime Minister being convicted for corruption with the case of uh, Saudara Said Shadi. How, how would you reconcile that? What, what, what would you say to that? I think especially as a member of parliament and a former minister, that level of scrutiny is justified, warranted, and I have a duty to answer. In the context of Malaysia today, especially post-Sheraton, where institutions of government can easily be weaponized, and I don't think I have to quote the number of times where it has been weaponized, and the fact that those who jump and switch sides very quickly, people like Tajuddin who was being investigated um, as chairman of Prasarana, and literally the day after pledging support for the Prime Minister then Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin, people like Xavier, who were being investigated and after jumping ship immediately, thing went silence, Musa Man, I mean the cases, is uncountable. But for my case, I'd suggest to not have that benefit of doubt, but to look at it at its details. Someone like myself who did not jump for two years, being persecuted in the craziest of ways, being called up almost every month, not just me, but my family members, and the case only brought forward after one year and a half. During the final month before the Prime Minister fell in an attempt to consolidate power. But being someone young, when I join politics, I know that it will be dirty, toxic and challenging. And that's why I started believing in the line of Barani Kranabanar. And if there's nothing to hide, why afraid? fight it out till the end, I have faith that our judiciary is clean, fair and just and I want to go through that process and I believe there will be some very interesting information which will be released when that time comes. But above and beyond that, I think it's finding a way on how we can move forward as a country. Once we build strong institutions, decentralise power from the hands of political elites, I think then we build a system in which you can mirror the UK, in which, in which even the Prime Minister could be investigated, be fined, and be put through a vote of confidence. I firmly believe if Tan Sri Arif had not accepted the vote of confidence or no confidence brought forward by the opposition, most likely he would still be the Speaker today. But the fact of the matter is today, institutions are still largely controlled, and there's a lack of a de de decentralisation of power. So how we move forward because we discuss a lot about what happened in Sheraton. I think the past is the past. It's about how we could move forward. And there are so many things which we were very close in doing. In March 2020, we were about to table our very first political funding act. In March 2020, we were about to table the, limit, the, the bill to limit the terms of the Prime Minister, IPCMC. I mean, I can tell you, there's countless of reforms. So I understand the frustration of Tantri, Mune. as which was shared, Tantri Mune, because it was not done enough. I mean, if you had known the story in Undi 18, it would have been postponed for another term. Sorry, not for another term, for the next parliament sitting. But then, I thought enough is enough. We've postponed it twice. We cannot afford to postpone it. And now, with the benefit of hindsight, thank God we didn't postpone it. Mm. So moving forward, I think it's about improving institutions and being less reliant on individuals and personalities because institutions outlast personalities and parties. And once we have that, 
We can mirror better systems like the UK, in which when an investigation happens, proper procedures carried out, that's when people need to step aside. But the fact of the matter is today, we have not reached that level of system. Precisely. Now, you see, coming back to a point that Tan Sri Arif made just now, even in quoting from the book, he likens the parliamentary rules and regulations to like the operating system, right? And ultimately, it is about the user's knowledge and motivation. And pretty much the same goes for the bigger system. It's not just the parliamentary system. Uh, the rules in parliament, right? It's the rest of the laws, the institutions, and all that. But maybe I pose this question to um, Dato Ambiga, right? Do you think our democracy can be even considered a mature democracy? Uh, to me, no. And, but, you see, the, the question is, like you say, even if you put all this into place, like what Tan Sri was saying, these people are like playing with sand. It's like bullies in the sandbox. They will still have that mentality. So does that solve the problem? Can I just speak? Yep. Okay, yep. sorry. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, before that, uh, thank you for playing the Nagara Ku Johnson oh. at the beginning. Yep. Uh, if ever anyone loses hope, I think when you hear that, it, it, you'd realize why we're fighting for this country. And in fact, we have in the audience people who actually actually spilled bl blood for this country, uh, and we should thank them for their service. Um, but some of them are heartbroken at uh, what they're seeing the country become. Uh, become. Now, what I would say is, um, if I could answer that question first, no, we're not a mature <laughs> democracy. I'll tell you why. It's not that we haven't been around for a long time. We have. Um, there was some semblance of democracy. In the old days, if you, and I think Tan Sri Arif says this in his book, if you read the Hansards from the old days, you will see the maturity of the debate that was taking place at that time. But we have since just uh, disintegrated, and, um, and I think it's the people we put in there. Because However good your rules are, however much you draw up uh, uh, guidelines and, and you tell people they must be civil, uh, ultimately it's down to the individuals who are sitting there. And I'll tell you a little story. When I was actually, we were lobbying against the National Security Act. You remember that hideous act. Um, and we went to parliament. And I can tell you the number of people, they were going to vote on it either that day or the next day. The number, they hadn't even read the bill. The, they, ISA. the MPs, there were MPs, I, I'm talking about the government side, hadn't even read the bill. Um, so as far as they're concerned, it's not their job. They are there to just vote the way the government wants them to vote, full stop. Um, so really we have to change, you, you can have rules, and I think Tan Sri Aris was correct in the insisting on the expansion of the select committees, because what that makes them do, and actually you can't say it hasn't worked, huh, Johnson. My understanding is it has. Uh, there's actual serious work being done at committee level where they call the ministry uh, officials, etc., and they question them. That is a very, very good start. But, you know, the way parliament is being treated now, I, I, I think it, they, it, it's a joke. Now, also let me answer this question which Tan Sri Muni raised. Um, and it's this. Thanks to the Perak case, the federal court Perak case, it allows the uh, monarchy, whether it's state or, 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 the, or uh, national, to determine who enjoys the confidence of the majority by uh, their own investigations. In other words, uh, their highnesses or his majesty, they determine who has the majority. So they have these one-to-one -one meetings. Uh, they have people saying, we have numbers, we have numbers. Lists and lists, etc., etc. To me, wholly unsatisfactory. It's a wrong, to me, I don't agree with that Parak decision. That is what has got us into this mess. For me, confidence is determined on the floor of parliament. 
not with each one whispering in the ear of the, <laughs> you know, uh, of the monarch. I'm not blaming uh, 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 His Majesty for doing it. There's a federal court case that allows it, but it is unsatisfactory. And I think, e and even if you go through that process, you have to insist they go back to Parliament and test their majority there. That didn't happen here. And as I understand it, some of the numbers were not, yep. Uh, yep. Were not accurate. Yep. Yep. Okay, so I mean, so are we a mature democracy? We can, but we've got to put in better people. We're the ones who are choosing, the, voting for these people, you know? So uh, you, you need more mature people. And I tell you, no matter how many rules you have, you need people to act in good faith. You look at what was happening in, in, in America, it's supposed to be the biggest and best democracy in the world, yet when a leader decides to act in bad faith, there is nothing anyone can do. Exactly. So ultimately, it's that. You have to put in people that you trust. I trust Hannah, I trust Said Sadiq, I have no problem. Teresa, because I know they won't be sellouts, you see? But I'm not sure you can say that about everyone. Yeah. Right. So, okay, just to close off the round, uh, YB Hanna, I realize looking back that after the Sheraton move, it was, correct me if I'm wrong, it was only, well, apart from DAP, there was Amana, but I don't know that much about Amana, but I know for a fact that none of the DAP members of parliament hopped, right? Can you tell us, can you share with us, is there a secret? What is it about the DAP or your ideology that makes them so, you know, uh, loyal to the party? Because, well, I think some of you might know, I've been in politics before, I've been in a party, and that party actually had, I think, 30% of the members hop, right? So maybe you can shed some light on this because now we are thinking, how do we get the people to vote the right people into parliament? And that's not easy. Would you like to comment on that? I, I don't know the secret formula, uh, Johnson, but one thing I know, when we select our candidate, we have a panel of uh, leaders choosing the, the candidate. And on top of that, during campaign time, we have very extensive campaign period where we have to go and face the people. So DAP is known for their huge charama setting and where you have to face the people when you're speaking. And so the idea of what happened in Perak, the first defection when that happened and how the elected reps, family members were not even able to go to the market because of how they were so terrified of the people, punishing them. I think that image stuck with a lot of us. The fear of facing the people, if we ever do that, is, is huge because of our ground, our members, our branches and all that. And so I, I think maybe because of that, the idea of jumping is quite far-fetched for us, the 42 of us. So the, the politicians should be fearing the people. Of course. Not yeah. the people fearing the politicians, yeah. right? Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to now give an opportunity for everyone to join the conversation. Yeah. Um, but can I ask if you could direct, uh, can I just get first few to direct the questions towards the book? Then we can get on with the, the rest of the panel discussion. So this is how we're going to do it. Um, the mics for asking questions are in, up front here. You can queue up by the side or just put up your hand because this is just the start of it. Then we can um, start with the questions and we'll do the physical audience questions first and then later on one of our crew members will read out questions, if any, from the um, live streams on YouTube and Facebook. Anyone? Yes, please come forward. Thank you. If you could state your name and uh, briefly your question. Hello, my name is Cheryl. I'm a Malaysian. That's all I want to be known for. Um, so I have um, the opportunity to speak to 
um, Malay grassroots people uh, as an NGO. And this is what they share. Uh, one of the ladies, uh, she said that um, Malaysia tak boleh jatuh ke tangan orang Cina. Okay, this is a real, um, uh, a real account that I am sharing. So now, we know that in Malaysia, we also have gerrymandering to delineate the, the constituencies to 70% that are majority Malay Muslim demographics. So, um, what, are the, what are the chances that we can fight for a Malaysian Malaysia? Because we have people everywhere, we, we know exactly what the problems are already. We don't need to be told. But there are people in the crowd and in Malaysia who have been fighting for a Malaysian Malaysia for all their lives, to the point where their hair is already graying. Will we ever see a democratic society within this lifetime, within about 10 years' time. Everyone is giving up. Thank you. Who would you like to direct your question to? Um, Tan Sri Arif. Tan Sri. I think it's on. Okay. I, I can sympathize with the, your statement. That's so why just now, in response to Johnson's earlier question, I mentioned about uh, this Malay Muslim narrative, which to me was a major factor as well that led to the defections, the downfall of uh, Pakatan Harapan. It got so toxic, you know, for every little issue, it's uh, couch along these lines. So I'm not surprised at the grassroots level, people have been unduly influenced by this toxicity. They believe in it. Um, although, if you talk to the educated group in the urban areas, you may find some improvement. But even there, you see, uh, we get a feeling that on the ground, even in the towns, there's great division. You know, the Malays will still think that they are threatened, right? That um, there's a danger in pushing the Malaysian Malaysia uh, agenda. It's all DAP's work. You, you know, Christians are coming and looking around every corner. And, you know, this sort of narrative leads to a lot of toxicity. Okay. What can we do about it? I think we can do something about it. Expand the middle ground. This is where people like you who come and are willing to listen and question and participate in discussions like this should continue doing this kind of dialogue and, and, and uh, be on the ground. And please turn up to vote. Um, I get the impression now, uh, nowadays that a lot of people are so put off by politics uh, that they don't want to vote. The thing is futile, you know. Uh, I get involved even right down to the uh, most basic level, um, in the Chawangan level. I can see it. Oh, what's the point of being active nowadays? What's the point of voting? We voted, um, but look at all the frogging. You know, what's the point? So I'm not going to vote. Eh? Hence, Johor, how many percent? 54 point something, eh? if I remember rightly, which is atrocious. This is where something must be done. Why, how do we do it? We can't think of changing the entire 222 members of parliament. That's not on. That's not viable. But if you get to work and support MUDA, maybe support Grak Independent, and they've yet to show the metal, yeah? Support good candidates like Hana Yo, yes, Sadiq, of course, Muda. Right? People from Amana, I'm not saying because I'm from Amana, but they have shown mm. uh, how they can perform in parliament and are willing to perform and give and take. Vote for people like that. And even Amno, for that matter. Yeah? Make sure that you get people who, who deserve to be in parliament. But of course, you will still find the rogues. Yeah? You will still find the kingmakers. 
you still find your warlords. You can still find, you will still find people who talk nonsense in parliament. Yeah? Toxic and play the Malay Muslim narrative and, and so on and so forth. But let's expand the middle ground. But when I say this, yeah, mind you, we have to be fair. Um, the toxicity comes not only from <laughs> the Malay segment, you know, it yes. cuts across the board. So we have to be very careful. Let's group together, let's group the middle ground, strengthen it. And I think if you do it, the Malaysian Malaysia formula may just come to fruition. Perhaps not in the form that we all envisage. But if you can achieve half of it to start with, mm -hmm. I think there's real progress. But let's not you know, cut down the progress yeah, to 20% to 10% and until it becomes non existent. Mm. There is a danger there. You know, so go out and vote and participate in politics. Okay. Among the young. I, I would like to pass the ball to you, actually, Said Sadiq. Um, precisely and as uh, Tanshree mentioned, Johor and Muda. Now, despite the very low voter turnout, Muda had significant success there. And I think the same question should be pointed to you yeah. because obviously you're Malay Muslim, but also you, you are the future, the, the, the youngest generation here. I don't know if Kira is here, she registered. I, I, she probably might say something, I would uh, suggest she do, she does. But how would you, you know, steer the Malay Muslim narrative in that direction towards uh, a Malaysia Malaysia? I think it is that exact narrative which kills the Malays, regresses them for decades and imprison them forever. The same people, I mean, to be honest, not the first time hearing this. I go back to my kawasa and I hear the same thing. Every time I take a photo with Hana Yo, oh Allah, say, oh, she's about to Christianize you. She's never done that. I know she's scared of cats, that's it. But my answer, and... and on this part, I don't mince my words. The same politicians who perpetrate this racist, divisive narrative are the ones who don't even trust our national schooling system because they'll end up sending their kids for Tadika in France and then primary, secondary school in Eton, but then say, oh, you cannot change our national education system. Ah, English is bad. Make our school more religious. They're hypocrites. These are the very same people who have tons of offshore accounts and despite earning a salary of 16000 or 25000 which is a lot, but let's be frank, as MPs, but they have houses which are worth tens of millions and offshore accounts across the globe who receive direct nego contracts for their brothers, children, and then say, oh, we need to help Bumiputra entrepreneurs. But in the end, they get hundreds of millions of ringgit of direct nego contracts. The reason why I dare to fight the battle, because I knew during my term in KBS, everything was done through open tender, that I declared, I was the first minister to declare all my assets, and above and beyond that, even when they wanted to go after me, they went through every single damn contract in KBS, and they couldn't find anything. So my answer to this narrative is that if you want to see Malay suffer, then perpetuate this. Because in the end, the same Malay politicians don't even trust the system which they want to perpetuate. Just to share one small experience. In Cabinet, when we're talking about education reforms, about the need to increase contact hour for math, science and English, not just PPSMI, but increase the contact hour. People say it's about money, it's not. Do you know per capita today, education spending, we outspend Singapore and Japan per capita. Yet, our PISA ranking is much lower. What worries me the most, even middle-class Malays are now choosing to send their children to private international school when they need to spend 25% of their net monthly salary on their children's education. It's damn worrying. But when you go to parliament, oh, tak boleh, kekalkan sistem sama. Sadiq, kamu ni, apologies, DAP, nak hancurkan pendidikan Islam. I mean, really, if you want to argue with them, I get so frustrated. I remember in cabinet, I actually asked, where do you send your children to? Where do you send your grandchildren to? 
The same people who want to perpetuate the same divisive system are the ones who don't even have faith to send their children, grandchildren through the same schooling system. So just to briefly summarize, in my very short time, I mean, youth and sports is the smallest ministry. But what I can say today is that in a short time span, when BTN, Biro Tata Negara, is one of the biggest patronage network, if I wanted to be the most popular Bersatu minister, I would have retained it. BTN from Prime Minister's office was moved to youth and sports ministry. It had tens of millions at the minister's disposal. In the first three months, I removed BTN completely. And this is coming from a Malay party. What was it replaced with? Malaysia Future Leader School, multiracial, bipartisan. I invited all state ministers or ex-co uh, ex members to be involved, whether in government or opposition. And until today, the, the replacement mechanism after three ministers are retained. I removed. I mean, I had to remove it because I was a victim of BTN. I mean, if you ask your children or grandchildren who had gone to BTN, it's not the same in the 1980s, 1990s. When I went to BTN in IIUM, it's about showing posters of Lim Kit Siang and Tok Guru Nik Aziz as the biggest devils of Malaysia. I mean, I was lucky enough that I didn't get to see Hana Yo as the Christianized, whatever, wanting to Christianize the whole of Malaysia. So, in the end, you just need to take some level of political disruption, courage, and shock to the system to change it. Because my fear is if there's no shock, you can change a government 10 to 20 times, the same people, same structure and same system, no actual change will take place. So that's why I think with GI coming in, with more parties coming, it's great. Why? I think constituents should ask their leaders, MPs, and party presidents, what is your stance on policies? How do you want to change the education landscape. My fear is if you don't ask these questions, really you'll get leaders who are wearing cloaks of progress, but in reality, when are in government are unwilling to make that change. Because I know I received so much resistance to Undi 18, Political Funding Act. It took me one year and a half to convince. And mind you, cabinet empowered me, Majlis President Pakatan Harapan gave me the role to lead on this path. There were many things which took a long time because in the end, there are people who simply do not want that change. And these are the questions which should be answered before elections. Thank you. It seems to me that the question <laughs> should, or rather the answer is in the people demanding that change, demanding that accountability that Tanshri Mune was talking about and making their decisions heard, right? And so, to me, it, it's still it's sort of a circular thing. We're still chasing our tails somewhat. But let's, let's carry on with the, the next question. Oh, good evening, Tan Sri. Uh, this is something you mentioned just now. If a public servant was summoned under Parliament's standing order, 83 subsection 2, and the person refused to appear before the Parliamentary Select Committee, claiming he's not legally bound, claiming he's not answerable to the committee. Yet, to date, no action for contempt of uh, parliament. Now, if a public servant has no respect for the parliament, how do you expect the public to trust the parliament? I'm Lalita. Thank you. You see, we are skirting around the same fundamental problem. Yeah, about political culture, about understanding the rules of the game. The laws are there, uh, beautifully drafted in the Houses of Parliament uh, Privileges and Powers Act 1950, a very old act. It's there, it's very clear. Right? But uh, you see, the recent episode um, has it that they quibble over words. I don't know, I've not seen the letter. They say it's not a summons. Or well, this particular person says it's not a summons. It is just a request. Fine. If that is a quibble, then what can be done is the committee can write a summons. Yeah? Commanding the person to appear before the committee. That was not done. Why was it not done? Either they are totally ignorant of the law, the legislation, or they just don't want to do it. I tend to think it's a letter. 
right? I mean, people are so satisfied with uh, some lame excuse, and they say, let's uh, let the matter lie there. But the law is there. And here, if you look at the standing orders and the Act, particularly in particular Section 9 of the 1950 Act, the Speaker has got the power, you know, uh, to direct that person uh, to appear uh, upon pain of punishment. It's there, you know. Um, what we wanted to do, I mean, Hannah would know this because we were in intense discussion at one time on amending the rules. We wanted to amend uh, the, the Act and the standing orders to increase the penalty. And now, of course, it's 1,000 ringgit or something. You know? We wanted to increase it, I think it was 50,000, even more. Never got to do it. I mean, again, shout out the move. Everything got scuttled. We wanted to do that. Huh? But point is, the rules are there. The people in power ought to be made aware and ought to be compelled to follow the law. How do we do it? Just in two minutes, how do we do it? We must also set in place the institutions, whether informal or semi-formal, to compel them to do that. How do we do it? That's why we need to have things like people's assembly you know, as an alternative to parliament, to compel parliament or MPs to behave as they should. And APPG, I have not mentioned it in the book, all party parliamentary groups, we should set up more so that civil society will, you know, cooperate with MPs and get all these little things sorted out mm. and make sure the public are aware that the laws are there and MPs better behave, committee chairman better behave, a speaker better behave and make sure the rules are followed and we abide by the rule of law. If nothing is done, we're going to see a repeat uh, of all this again and again and we see what I call the dance of the seven veils. Yeah, nice dance here and there, you know, but nothing gets done. That is why this anti-hopping legislation uh, personally, I would like to see it in black and white before I really believe it's going to happen. Yeah, it's taken, taking such a long time. Yeah, yeah. Gobin assured us you'll, you'll see uh, a draft of it by the end of this month. I just heard in, him what say that in what form? In what form? Okay, I mean, that, that's the big question. Yeah. It, it looks like uh, Hannah wants yeah. to jump in, and I would like you to jump in. But I just wanted to add this little question. Um, this was something I wanted to ask uh, uh, Tansri earlier, but equally you could answer it. The speaker obviously has a very pivotal role and the right person has to make the right decisions at that point in time. How do we ensure, and some of your, your solutions just now, does that help us to ensure that the right person is appointed to that pivotal position? Okay, I just want to first comment on Tansri Arif's uh, remark about strengthening select committee. I sat in the same standing orders committee with Tansri Arif, speaker as the chairman, and we have already drafted the paper to be tabled in parliament on reforming our standing orders. One of the key reforms we have put in place was to empower select committees to hold public hearing for their inquiries. That's something Selangor has done through CELCAT, and that's why you saw the Disneyland hearing, the MB crisis, all that broadcasted live. Uh, and so in this case, when the, table, when the paper was uh, prepared already uh, and the new speaker came in, I sit in the same committee today and I asked the speaker, when can you table that paper? Because it's already done. Everything is there. Just table it, right? And there were some excuses given. And this is something I want the MOU committee now, the steering committee, because one of the promises in this MOU is to strengthen parliament select committees. And I, I told Fami and the rest who are in the committee, I said, this paper needs to be in because there are actually a lot of good work being done by our current public accounts committee. Uh, but when it's in paper form, Malaysians don't like to read. And so it dies off. It, people lose interest. But if you have public hearing, then it would be a different case. During our time, the role of the speaker is so crucial. Just allow me to quickly point out three things that Tan Sri Arif did during his time. Very simple, people don't talk about it, but it created a lot of fear among the executive bench. The first one was that he restructured question time. Question time is important for ministers to come and answer 
on their policies. And what he did, he rearranged uh, question time according to ministries. So every day, there would be at least seven ministries slotted to come in and answer. So you cannot es escape. That's one. Number two, supplementary questions. He allowed more than three during our time. And so for us, answering questions, even though the standing orders say three, but when the speaker say, okay, because it's an important issue, I allow more time. And we had to do, I, had, I have done four questions before. Mm -hmm. And so when you know that the speaker would not take your side, even though he was appointed during our time, it creates fear, uh, fear among us. To When we come, we better be prepared. Mm -hmm. And so the night before, we would be going through all the data and all that because we know the speaker would not take our side. It's different now. It's different now. Now, it stops at question two, and the minister get away. Now, why we know they get away is because deputy ministers have to answer a lot of the questions. Mm. Uh, and the standard answer would be prepared by the civil servants. They would come with the standard answer, and we would have to amend because of all these supplementary questions that would come up. So when they read it now, I know, because I've read that before, and I know that's the standard answer. But when I'm not allowed by the speaker to ask supplementary questions in a meaningful way now, then, you know, they get away. Mm -hmm. Okay, the third thing he did was to introduce a uh, question day, uh, Waktu Pertanyaan Menteri, MQT, and at that time, the Prime Minister had to come and answer. So if you remember, Tun Dr. Made had to come before the House and answer. Uh, but you did not see that in Muhyiddin. You obviously don't see that during Ismail Sabri's time. So those were the three simple things just happened during question time that empower people, uh, elected reps especially, to ask question and finally during that time uh, select committees they were very independent uh, and so I remember Taman Rimba Kiara that was a big battle and when we didn't get our way with the minister appointed during our time we turned to the select committee we turned to public accounts committee and we say PAC please investigate this issue and they did Nuro Iza brought this up and then Kawo then followed up until the paper was table in parliament recently, where the PAC concluded that there was conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, so you see, at that time, right, when you're stuck with a minister, you could run to the select committee and you know something fair would come out of it. That happened during our time. Yeah. And that was largely because the speaker did what he was supposed to do and kept the legislature doing what they were supposed to do and the executives answering for it, right? Um, okay. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Richard. I'm a student. Um, okay, let's um, talk about the parliament. We mentioned about we want to fix this, we want to fix that. It seems that everyone in this room is not happy about what's happening in the parliament. I understand, Tansri, you were saying that we have all the standing orders, but it all boils down to enforcement and compliance because we are all human. You have the rules, whether we follow or not, it's a different story, right? Now, let's get on to it. Have we ever thought that maybe whatever that's happening is right. That's why what we are trying to do is an uphill task. Because as Bert Lanz, who used to work for uh, President Carter once said, you know, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. So I'm not even trying to play a uh, devil's advocate here. It's just like, perhaps this is it. Why work so hard? Because as a rugby, right, I'm going to tell you, um, how can I put this? I grew up knowing BN all this while. And then come May 2018, yeah, as a Chinese, um, I thought, this is it, okay? We have a change. But then, that is when all the social media, the, the, the Muslim Malay narrative comes up, very high up, okay? With the Papa Gomo and all those, came up so high up. And then when it went back to the other side, it came down. All right. So the question to you all and everyone here, as a person, as a father who has got three young children, right? Am I wrong to feel safe? Right? Because I feel safe now. I feel safe now. So the question is, not, not even a question, I'd rather have it as status quo. I'd rather have it as status quo. Whether it's morally right or wrong, again, I'm going to throw in Jeremy Bentham, who once said, you know, it becomes morally right if it gives the maximum pleasure and happiness to the mass. 
answer that, please. Thank you, Richard. Um, anyone like to take this? Uh, Amiga? Thank you for your honesty. And I think there are probably a lot of people who speak, uh, who think like you. But in my view, we're going to become a failed state if we do nothing. Uh, Sri Lanka is a, is a big example. The corruption levels are so high, it can never be acceptable. We will never progress as long as we don't address those key issues. Failure of institution means you are not safe, I am not safe, you know. Tomorrow, when I exercise my freedom of speech, if someone in power doesn't like it, I can go behind bars. Is that acceptable? It cannot be. We must always strive for the upholding of the rule of law. People think institutions are not important. They are vital. They are vital to our daily bread, actually. Bread and butter. To whether we live, to whether floods are controlled. That's a failure, institutional failure. How many people died? That's floods alone. COVID, badly handled, institutional failure. How many people died? Okay, refugees, etc. How many people have died? Now, if you think that's okay, and that's comfortable for you, fine. I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with poor people suffering. I'm not comfortable with vulnerable people suffering. And it will carry on. And it won't be long. You must have heard this, uh, uh, this uh, well, a sort of poem. First they came for the Jews. This is with near molars, right? And eventually the last sentence is, then they came for me. And there was no one there to defend me because you kept quiet. So I, it is comfortable, the position you're taking. You think you are safe, but you can never be safe unless everyone is safe. Now, the COVID crisis, again, I mean, I've said that, is, to me, was badly handled. Also institutional failure. They suspended parliament, institutional failure. We suffered, people suffered. The way they are cutting down trees in, in Pahang and in other states killed people because mm. the floods uh, came, people lost lives, they lost livelihoods. Is that an acceptable situation? It's not. You may not see it yet, but I can tell you, all of that is institutional failure. Parliament couldn't even, couldn't even convene to discuss, mm. the address the flood issues. Yes. That's not okay for me. And it must never be okay for anyone, ever. Because until the most vulnerable person in the community is safe, we are not a civilized society. So the question is whether we want to be a civilized society. I would imagine so. And I want to say one last thing. And this is in relation to disruptors. City is a disruptor, good for her, is what I say. She speaks her mind. She doesn't care. But there are not enough disruptors within Pakatan Harapan. You are giving, dishing up, same narrative, same people, and I'm telling you, you're not giving hope. I, I think, lah, okay? I mean, I, I don't know how everybody feels. And I'll tell you what the problem with keeping these people there. They think and they react to only the UMNO type behavior, okay? What is wrong with our country now is many, 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 many years of the UMNO way of thinking, UMNO way of doing things, and all the older leaders have got used to that. That is their reaction. The disruptors, like Muda and the younger generation, I can tell you, they are the ones giving us hope. Not the ones who are there repeating the same narrative. So what I'll say, sorry, uh, I, uh, just, just, and I'll conclude with this. I don't have to speak anymore after this. Lim Kitsiang, a statesman if ever there was one. He did so much for this country. And yet, when he thought it was time to leave, he left. We love him to bits, all of us, because we know he saw what he has done for the country. Yet, when it was time to leave, he left. And I agree with his decision to leave. So we thank everyone who brought us to this point where we have an opposition. I think all of them suffered, all of them did a lot. But you better do something about addressing what the people want for the next general elections because I know many people who aren't even bothering to come out to vote because PH has 
really got no new message, no hope that they are giving them. Thank you. Thank you, Ambika. I want to comment on that uh, false sense of safety you felt now, uh, you, the one that you are feeling now. Now, when we were in government that 22 months, your opposition was reduced to two parties, AMNO and PAS. And AMNO, one stands for race, one stood for religion. So every angle, every single issue, they drove it down race and religious angle. And that's why even an accident became racial and it was amplified. They went to the street, they, they, you know, ev everything they did. So people felt very scared and terrified during that time when we were in government because the opposition was playing race and religion up. We did nothing to counter that. We took for granted that we were safe, honestly. I, for one, when I went to parliament, I thought Amno is finished because I look at the numbers, not expecting betrayal from our side. I thought, you know, they are, they are not going to come, they're not going to make a comeback, right? Now, what you have, you have opposition multiracial. Many opportunities, we could have played up the racial and religious angle, but that's not the responsible thing to do, and we did not do it. And that's why, because we don't drive up these issues that way, people generally felt now it's peaceful. Because we play by the rules, we are responsible elected MPs. Now, the last thing I want to say is, the reason why you feel safer today is because the racist people who used to play up racial, religious uh, angles, today are selling Kluaga Malaysia slogan to you. That is a false sense of security. Because if you really want to know whether they have changed in their mindset, you have to look at the policies. Have the policies changed and reflect Kluaga Malaysia? That one, I think, you know, history will judge us, but the incompetence, Incompetence will kill lives, exactly like what Dato Ambiga has said. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Hannah. Would you like to add to that? Because I would like to hear your voice, Tansri Mune, on this from a slightly different perspective. Actually, I think, you know, what should we be looking to in the short, medium term? Okay. Uh, I mean, you know, general elections will have to take place you know, by, 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 by June next year, you know, by, by June next year, one year from now, they, they could take place earlier, yeah. Uh, so that's something we have to think about. Uh, and I think, uh, in fact, uh, Dato Ambiga uh, wrote a piece in Between the Lines yes. about two days ago, I think, uh, uh, saying, you know, we must exercise our right and be intelligent in exercising it, of course, uh, some people will be a bit exhausted, you know, we exercised a thing before, in 2018 we gave it one heave ho and then look what happened, yeah, but we should not let that, you know, determine, uh, you know, how we think when we exercise our rights. Maybe there will be no majority uh, in parliament as a result of the vote. It's good, therefore, in such a situation to have strong, independent-minded MPs, you know, uh, yeah. In Parliament. So that's one thing, you know, short term. The other thing to, however, worry about, huh, worry about is the judiciary, you know. We must look out for the judiciary and it, it, if it comes under any kind of, of attack, uh, the worst that happened in our history is 1988, you know, of course. But if it comes under any kind of attack uh, and, 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 and the Chief Justice hmm, uh, is holding, they're holding together, but we have to watch out, you know, we have to, to, be, to voice our concerns huh, very clearly if the judiciary is, 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 is going to be compromised again huh, mm. and if people get moved around, even, God forbid, sacked like before. So that's a concern, you know, an immediate term concern given what's been happening uh, recently. Uh, so those are, I would say, the two things we want to look out and think about clearly. It, it sounds to me, Tansri, and I think uh, some of you might agree, is that the people actually have a huge responsibility to play in terms of defending and protecting the institutions of our country and not leaving it to the politicians and, and 
you know, so-called uh, public servants, right? Okay. Um, I noticed this one. Are you also... Okay, so there are two questions here. I think we'll have to sort of... Okay, there are no questions online, so we can carry on with this then. Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, hi, my name is Rifaya. I'm a student. Um, so my question is very simple. Um, so we often ask the young people, the younger generation, to speak out, to voice out. Buat video, bagi orang tahu apa orang, you know, situasi semasa. I mean, I receive that a lot as a undi 18, uh, as part of undi 18 movement. But what we often forget that these young people have to pay heavy by doing so. Um, I've been to IPD a lot. Um, I do receive uh, threats and also that I'm with uh, Dato Ambiga in court for Undi 18 uh, movement. And also, I right now, um, apa yang menjadi tanda-tanda saya ialah semasa zaman persekolahan, kita sering menyanyikan lagu Negaraku dan juga baca ikra luka negara setiap hari Isnin pagi. Tetapi bila dah habis zaman sekolah, kita dah tak buat benda tu. Berapa ramai yang boleh membaca ikra tanpa melihat? Berapa ramai yang boleh membaca ikra ataupun boleh mengetuai ikra tanpa kita perlu membaca erti ikra luka negara? So, I rasa macam zaman sekarang, for my generation, I don't want the older generation determine ataupun tentukan what should my generation do in future. And what I expected, you know, um, my question is to the, uh, I mean, YB Syed Sadiq and Tan Sri Muhammad Arif. Does the parliament um, ready to receive the younger generation in during next GE and upcoming um, general election? Because right now we can see that, you know, a lot of um, political parties dah, uh, you know, berlumba-lumba untuk hantar calon paling muda dalam PRN ataupun PRU. So, yeah, does the, the parliament ready to accept us? Thank you. Their side. Muda would never succeed if we do not dare to disrupt because then we'll be just another opposition party and the public will never be able to differentiate us because there's no new messaging. It's not just about leadership. Huh? I mean, you can change one leader but if the messaging is the same, institutions are the same, then we won't go anywhere. So my message is this. If conventional political parties are unwilling to change, then we force them to change. One thing which we have which they don't is time. We are willing to bite losses, to deal with losses, because we have time. And um, I think the older leaders know that. So we are in a unique position to negotiate better. If they're unwilling to nominate more young leaders, if they're unwilling to move away from the old kind of politics of patronage, corruption, division, and not willing to bring in a new narrative to shape Malaysia, then let's fight and return the mandate back to the people and let the people decide. My biggest fear is what Amiga just shared. The biggest enemy of opposition is ourselves. That we're unwilling to change. We feel a sense of comfort despite losing one election to another, yet AMNO is changing more than us. I mean, I don't think people realize this. In Malacca, Amno fielded more young politicians. In Johor, they did it. They are willing to change leaders more than us. Look at how often they change their state leaders to nominate. And I think in Amno, their mantra is very unique. Their mantra is, we don't care who our leader is as long as we are in government. That's why they could back Tantri Muhyiddin, they could back Ismail Sabri. You think they like Tantri and, and now Dato Sri Ismail? Of course they don't. Right? But they will do whatever it takes to be part of power, right? Because that's their psyche. But for ourselves, we are unwilling. And I always say the biggest mistake and tragedy of opposition is that we keep on talking about the message of change, but now we're no longer the change makers. We really are not. We are hesitant to change. We are so comfortable. And I think that will lead to our defeat. So to Muda, I mean, we are already in this stage. Why fear being that disruptor? I mean, people think, I tell in Johor, we start from zero. If we get zero, it's okay. Now in parliament, there's only one MP. 
I'm pretty sure my friends in opposition know if I'm willing to lose my ministerial post and at the same time get dragged in court after more than two years, have my family members go in and out of MACC, PDRM, I mean, it's uncountable. My mom is called up by MACC more than me. So if I'm willing to do that, what la, is the problem of losing one additional seat? So my message to opposition, if you're unwilling to change, then let's battle it out. Because my future, our future, does not lie in the hands of a few individuals. And we need to fight for that change if we truly believe in it, and let's disrupt Malaysia for good. Thank you. Thanks, Yari. Let me say this. In my book, I have paid tribute yeah, to the younger members of uh, the House and the female members of the House, the ladies and the youth. From where I stood, I could see the caliber of these young MPs and the ladies were way, way higher than the old ones. Yeah? And um, I think we should, as voters, make sure that we get more young MPs in the House and more female MPs in the House. Uh, female MPs now, we have about 15%. It should go up. And I think um, good show in Johor for Muda. Um, I mean, we have to look beyond that one seat. Uh, look at the number of votes they managed to garner. Today, Johor, one vote. I hope we'll see five at least in Parliament in the next general election. That's all that we need. We don't need 20 muda eh? or, or 20 grad independent. We just need a sufficient number of independently minded, the disruptors as we call them, to be in Parliament and then it will be adjusted accordingly. You know? And uh, maybe I just say one other thing, eh, Johnson. All this talk about institutional reform and so on and so forth. We must never forget, this is an answer to Richard's point. Eh? Uh, Richard, who claims to be a student, but he actually is not. He's, <laughs> uh, he's currently a student. Um, we must never forget, we cannot be too comfortable with the status quo. When institutions are floundering, are fast disappearing in terms of trust and so on and so forth, because there is a connect between transparency, strong institutions, and economic growth. I think leaders must be made to realize this. Uh, we can destroy all institutions so we can kiss goodbye to the economy. That's it. You know? So if you, you can't say, ah, life is comfortable now, I don't want to be disrupted. Ultimately, you'll be disrupted because the economy will suffer. And other economies will shoot ahead. Vietnam, you know, and all the rest. And we will be left wondering, you know, the grand old man of Southeast Asia, where have we gone wrong? And be asking the same questions. Huh? Yeah? Where have we gone wrong? So, I mean, that's it. Thank you, Atlantri. So we have two last questions. I noticed Siti wanted to ask a question as well. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Alan, uh, Malaysian. OK, so um, here is what I, why I think I agree with Ambiga. Uh, the opposition, I won't say Pati Harapan, I would say the opposition really needs a new narrative. The current narrative that we have will not uh, bring about the numbers and you, I mean, I still remember the, the things that people were doing flying all the way back just to vote. Um, and the current leader and the narrative is not gonna, it's not gonna make it. Um, Hannah, I, I disagree with what you just said just now about not saying anything about the Malaysia for all Malaysians um, because by not saying or not playing to the uh, dirty tricks is in a way agreeing or allowing their voice to be louder. So I think we need to look at that as well because the narrative is this is Malaysia. It's for everyone. So I hope the opposition looks into that and you know carries out the Malaysia for all Malaysians. My question, um, and this is to, I guess, to everyone. Um, 
What has happened with this issue um, when PN was appointing parliamentary members to sit in GLCs? Because if I'm not mistaken, I read somewhere that there is actually a law against that. And if that law is there, why, why then are they not um, enforced? Who's accountable for it? And what's being done? Thank you. Um, can we also take the comment or question from City? Then everyone can uh, wrap up and answer at the same time. Thank you. Ah, good evening, everyone, especially the panelists. Um, Okay, I just want to mention a few, uh, touch on a few things. Number one, about this old and young thing. I have an issue about that. I don't think it has to go by age. It has to be based on new faces, new blood, okay? So it doesn't mean young will bring a better change. No, the problem is that for years, this, the youngsters of Malaysia have been brainwashed into a certain way of thinking, okay? So we cannot expect all the youngs will be like Sai Sadeh, okay? Not many, like Sai Sadeh and the young woman just now. I have not met many. So majority are very, very uh, 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 scared to speak up, okay? So it is about new faces, new blood, new ideas for Malaysia. Doesn't matter what age you are, as long as you are fit and strong to fight for the country. That's number one. Number two, I want to mention about this feeling safe. Uh, you know, I have met many who actually think that their life is good until it hits their family. Okay, for example, death in custody. You know, you, can, you, you think that only, uh, uh, what's that, uh, criminals will be arrested. Sometimes innocent people are arrested as well, and then they are being brought into this, uh, you know, police station and suddenly die for nothing. Until it happens to your family, then only you know that it is some, something seriously wrong in our institutions. Number three, why Gra Independent actually exists? I don't want to be a politician. I hate politicians. But I feel that I have to do something. Because from what we have seen, even the so-called friendly politician parties, they have failed us. They have no new narrative. And what we see is that they keep on fighting who, when somebody should be the Prime Minister or, or all that. So I, we feel that it's time that the Raya take the bulls by its horns and fight for our own. Because if we are independent, we, have, we are not answerable to any boss or leaders. We are answerable to the constituents, the Raya. And what I'm going to say is that for us, this new narrative I'm going to bring, I'm going to advocate for the separation of religion and state because that is really the problem that actually brings us down in Malaysia. That is really the key. From this using religion and race, of course, we can't run from being, uh, you know, race uh, connected to religion in Malaysia. That, then it, it allows them to be more corrupted because they are dumbing down the Malaysians, especially the Malays, you know. Uh, they are giving out information that, like just now the guy said, or oh, the Malay said, we cannot give this uh, power to the Chinese. Because this is what the politicians have been telling them. This is what the Labai have been telling them. This is what the ulama have been telling them in the drama. You know, they have used the facilities of the Usra, the masjid, uh, you know, government uh, uh, halls to narrate this, that the Chinese is taking over the country. The, the Christians are actually, uh, uh, you know, so we have to actually understand... City, can you wrap up? Yes. Yeah. Last one. Why separation of religion and state is because... Religion is under the Sultan. Give it back to the Sultan. It is not against religion. Federal government should be managing the country for all, for all Malaysians. And this is what we want PH to fight for. But fight for these issues. No, not, not just corruption, not just for all these small, small things. The biggest thing. Start with the separation of religion and state. 
because right now they are infiltrating into our education, into all government agencies, even the rights of non-Malays to wear a skirt. You know, even I, if I want to wear a skirt, it's nobody's business. So please, PH, change your narrative to something stronger in which we can then feel, yes, we have now a strong opposition to fight for. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Siti. Okay, there's a request for one final uh, question or comment. Um, so, so sorry, sir. Um, but make it very, very brief, Mr. Chu. Um, just one minute, yeah. My name is Chu Tamsang. I am two generations ahead of most of you here. And uh, because of this age, I have observed in the last, since 1957, the country has gone for oh, two generations. The Chinese people believe two generations, there will be a disaster. If you run a business, the Chinese people believe two generations, the business will collapse. So I, when I listen, look at the Malaysia, using this, this analogy, I feel that since 1957, the country is actually slowly, slowly going downhill. And today, most of you sitting here will agree that we are not really a great country as we started. Uh, there was a prediction that we could follow Sri Lanka. I hope not. But financially, we could be in Sri Lanka's position very soon. But having a look at this young man up there, I feel that it's time that uh, slowing down the deterioration of our economy and our society, the hope is going to turn. If we tonight is convinced that we can get the young people to be like Siddiq sitting up there and not like me sitting down there, we are the one who sit and observe. The young people should be the front one. And I think the optimism should start more like now. If things take 60 years to become bad, let's not think and kid ourselves that in the next election, Lua, Lua, everything will become good. It may take a new another 20, 30 years to turn around. So I won't be here to see that turn around. But the people sitting in here, young faces here, you are the hope, not me. But I'm the one to point out to you there is that hope because things take 60 years to become bad may take another 30 years to become good. That observation, let's be very realistic. Let's be very realistic. But Mr. Chu, every journey takes the first up. step. I hope this is the first step. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chu. Okay, one minute, sir. No, no. There's one more gentleman. Sorry, yeah, if you could. Very quickly. Choi. Um, I'm only given one minute. I'll yeah. give to the one minute. You heard City just now. She said, we need a new narrative. If I'm no one to debate, he has to debate on our terms on the new narrative. Past one to debate, he has to debate with us on our new narrative. You see how the chair was just now? You got to make the new narrative so that the old narrative become obsolete. You see how we always stood up? What is your new narrative? Thank you, sir. It looks like there are more people who want to speak now. Can, um, can we indulge them in just, okay, if you could, just one minute question, yeah, or comment, please. Last two there. And that's, that's the end. I think we better keep the mic. <laughs> Hello. Hi, thank you for indulging. Um, I'll be very quick. We are currently hyper-focusing on so many single narratives, engaging in archaic political gridlocks, such as fear-mongering, cult of personality, 
seems to be the answer tonight. But I think it breeds more um, tokenistic voting blocks because to increase autonomy and decrease state violence, we should desensitize all state tensions, cultures, and moral and ideology. Then only organic change could happen within the system. But the new narrative my, I propose should not focus on more religious or um, cleavages of race. Might we move on to classism, which is always constantly the biggest issue we face in our socioeconomic because it's relative to context and we have pockets of conservative and pockets of liberal people within much larger context. So this is much more fair to address, I guess. Um, I'd be addressing to anyone who's willing to answer. Thank you. Thank you. And the last one, sir. Hi, good evening. I'm Colonel Hardial. I served the Malaysian Armed Forces for more than 30 years. We fought the communists. I've got many of my friends who were in RMC together with me. Some of them lost their legs. A clique of mine went blind, but they'll be trapped. There was a helicopter crash in, uh, in Kuching. The pilot was my best mate. One of the guys there was my student. In fact, two of them, General Mustafa Awang and General Bon Hashbullah, who were my bosses. Right? Here, we have got General Abdullah, who was a fighter pilot, and ex-Boys Wing. And three of you up there are also from Boys Wing, so you all can relate what the military was. Tan Sri Arif, Tan Sri Munir, and YB Said Sidi were from RMC Boys Wing, so they can relate a little bit to what I say. Now, we fought, the, we fought the communists. We handed over a peaceful, nice country to the government, to the politicians, to all of you. We handed over a nice, peaceful country. Many of my friends died serving this country. I'm lucky that I survived. The country is being destroyed. If you and I don't do anything about it, Nobody is going to do. No one should sit back and say, why rock the boat? Believe me, when you are out there in the jungle, walking for days without food, with the helicopter pilots coming in to send in food, the guy is hovering up there, but he cannot land because being shot by the communists, and he goes off. He keeps trying and trying and trying. Now, you people are living in this country because, not of me alone, but of, because of the veterans who fought for this country, fought against the communists. Now, we, the veterans, we have got sick and tired of the corruption and all the nonsense like everybody else. So we are coming back to serve the country again. The veterans are coming back to serve the country again. We are putting up a political party we are talking to some others, but the ROS, the Registrar of Society, is trying to play the executioner's role, and they're trying to cut us off. Yeah. Okay? Now, for the exception of a few, the parliament is a circus with clowns inside, right? For the exception of a few. The ones who remain, sorry, the the the, the Politic politicians come and go, the ones who remain are the civil servants. How much are we demanding from the civil servants? Are they serving us enough? Are they giving us what we need? The flights, the floods, the uh, in institutions which have failed are run and managed by the civil servants. Not only from the politicians, we also need to demand the civil servants serve us properly, right? They cannot let the politicians control them like it is happening in ROS, like it is happening in many other places. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if we could just have two minute final statements from each, starting with uh, Saudara Said Sadiq, and we'll end up here. Thank you. I mean, what is this new narrative and I just got Malaysia yang betul betul baru? Uh, it's a Malaysia which should not revolve around personality cults, which puts behind interests of institutions. We just heard many problems shared. These are not problems which revolve around one or two leaders. These are institutional problems which outlive many other leaders. 
So I say we focus on three crucial things. The first one is to build a country in which we strengthen institutions first and ensure that we have a team of leaders, young and old, dynamic disruptors who are willing to execute that plan. Once you strengthen institutions, my dream of a Malaysia is a dream in which even if five years from now, who's the leader who you may dislike the most? I mean, you can name a few. Whether it's Najib, Zahid, Ahmad Maslan, whoever it is, even if that leader becomes the prime minister, our country will still progress because the institutions are so strong that we will become a developed country. To me, that's one. Second, which cuts across all different ministries, is to build a system in which is viciously merit-based, which looks at factors of class. Because whether we like it or not, race and religion play a prominent role in Malaysia, but what cuts across race and religion is class. And I agree with the lady uh, just now. When you look at class, that's when you can justify giving scholarships to the poor Malay children and Chinese children and Indian children. But the fact of the matter is, status quo does not work. And when people ask me, what about perpetuating the NEP? Well, the fact is, after decades of the NEP, still, inequities among the Malays have grown wider. That more than a quarter of Bumi Putra Sabah and still live below Poverty line, not even middle class or B40, poverty line. So it is a problem of policies. And when there's a problem of policies, you surgically deal with that policy. And I think that's the way in which you do it. And the final part which I want to share is by looking at building strong public institutions to the point that politicians, rich businessmen, will pick public institutions first over sending their children abroad or through private and international schools. And that should be our aim. I am so afraid because the status quo which you are talking about, I'm meeting up with, I mean, my, my friends who are earning, I mean, after years of being maybe now middle class, earning about 3,000, 4,000, but they're willing to spend 1,000, 1,500 a month to send their children to private and international schools. So to me, the narrative should be about these issues to stop the decline of Malaysia and to ensure that in 10 years' time, Malaysia will become a full-fledged democratic country which has achieved developed status. And I believe, looking at where we are today, I know there's a lot of pessimism, but I've seen young leaders in many different parties or disruptors who may not be young who are willing to take up that fight. We will get there through times of crisis, comes great opportunity to reset Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you. Anna? Yeah. I, I think we are coming to a very critical time um, until we see the anti-defection law being tabled in Parliament. And if the anti-defection law is tabled and is successfully passed, then the heartache that we went through in the last four years would be worth it if that comes to pass. Now, until then... I just ask that um, whenever you make remarks, don't make sweeping remarks. That means all politicians are like this. Why? Can I tell you that there are good politicians and bad politicians? Bad politicians will never read your comments because they don't care about what you have to say. But the good ones will read. And when the good ones are disillusioned, you will get what you're reading in the news today. The good ones are leaving politics. And it will take a long time before you rebuild that synergy again. So can I ask that, you know, if you can find encouragement within you somehow, do reach out to those who are disillusioned and are about to leave. Because we need everybody in for the next battle in the next 12 months. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah. Three very short points. Um, City, yes, I agree with you. It's not just about age. It's new blood. It's new faces. That's what we want to see. Now, what I will say as, as a final comment is this. Change takes time. I mean, if you thought just bringing change that one time in 2014 would do the trick, it can never be. Change always takes time. It's painful. It actually, it's because of the change that we brought. We have some good things. We have the first woman chief justice. 
and a strong judiciary now. Uh, we had a strong, I said this in the article, uh, a strong SC. So, you know, and more women were put in. So I think be patient and don't forget, now we have how many million more new voters automatically were registered? Every one of you is registered huh? automatically. Four million. Uh, another, no, no, four million was previously who never voted, who yeah. never bothered registering. It's an additional few million huh? right. uh, after only 18. We need to educate them. So if you want to do something between now and the next election, that's good legwork to do in your neighborhoods, wherever it is. Make sure they know they're registered and uh, all they need to do is use their phone and go to the website uh, and, and they can determine if they're registered. And finally, I will say that we, that's why we must never give up hope because I, uh, like the Colonel just now, I am not prepared to give up on the investment of my father's generation and his friends and people like you and our army, the investment they have made into this country is what we are fighting for. We need to protect that investment. We cannot allow thieves to steal that away from us. Final word, time for a woman prime minister, for goodness sakes. I really think so. Siti <laughs> Kasim. Well, you know, this is our country, okay? All of us, we are a multiracial society. We must not let that be changed. And when we relate to other people, or when we cast our vote, and when we think about the problems of our country, we must always remember it is our country. It belongs to all of us. We must not give up. We must never give up. And therefore, when we cast our vote, vote for the person, for the individual candidate, not for the party, not for the race, and make him accountable, assuming he has been elected. Make him accountable. We have technology now. We have WhatsApp groups, generate opinion, raise questions. Why did you not do this and that in Parliament? Why did you not do so? So keep him honest, hmm? always accountable. However, politics is not just electing someone, having him in Parliament. It's also being conscious of the rights, your rights as a citizen, the importance of the institutions in the country. And it's not just political. It's not just political. There are so many, so many functional areas in which the rights are being violated. The environment, ESG issues. These are very important, how we live, how we get our health. So you must also be active in those areas. And the MPs must also be sort of seized of those issues as well and just not talk politics, politics, politics alone. Thank you. Thank you, Tansri. And finally... Tansri, Arif Yusuf. Yeah. I think as Malaysians, we shall rise to the occasion. I have great confidence in Malaysians. Uh, maybe you have reached somewhat uh, a new low because of recent events. But let's rise again. Yeah? There's nothing else that we can do except rise again now, if you are that low. Yeah? Um, corruption must never be regarded as a given. Media would tend to corrupt us into thinking that corruption is not. Fight against it. Corruption is the greatest evil that this country has undergone. Fight against it. Right? And um, resist the temptation to give too much credence to those who play the social media. Social media is a good, it is also an evil. Someone who is downright bad can be made to look good. But the problem is, we tend to give too much credence to the bad being good. So let's not be fooled into it. And this is where I think Parliament comes into the picture again. Institutions. Strengthen institutions, fine. 
but let's redefine institutions. It's not just parliament. It's not just parliament. It's not just the judiciary. It's not, not just the executive. Institutions must embrace the larger setting in society. I'm talking about civil society movements. Let's strengthen those. And you will find that they will check government. They will check uh, the MPs. They will check even the judiciary, for that matter. And I want to take a cue from uh, Tan Sri Mune on the judiciary is critical. We are now seeing attacks on the judiciary. Uh, let's fight against that. I think the lawyers are going to have an EGM next week. Uh, let's hope something comes out of it. If it's necessary to walk for justice again, let's walk for justice again. I think the judiciary must be protected. Right? <laughs> lastly, lastly, that is the point which I keep making in the book yeah, about expanding the middle ground, uh, make sure that the middle ground is strengthened, and let's get all this racist and uh, people with the com communal tinge where they belong namely at the fringes of society. Never allow them to take centre stage. And this is where I think we have failed uh, the Malaysians, the country, for so long. We have allowed them to take centre stage. We must never allow it. Yeah? Um, if we do, then they will play us out again. <laughs> you know? Forever and forever, we suffer. Narratives, the new narratives. To me, at least, when we talk about the new narrative, we're not talking about very grand things. We're talking about bread and butter issues. We're talking about the economy again. You know, it is the economy. What do we do in terms of getting jobs, getting food on the table, and so on and so forth? So all the political parties, I think, must try and get this narrative done. Fine. I mean, City Council says separation of government and religion and all that. These are higher ideals. I'm not saying it's not important. It's important. But education, food on the table, you know, employment, uh, accommodation, housing, these are all important things which have not been addressed. I've got two medically trained you know, graduates at home and both are unemployed. That's only in my, in my household, you know? uh, but enlarge it countrywide. And yeah. you will see the extent of the problem. Hmm. How many graduates are unemployed? What are we going to do about it? How many Malaysians are without proper accommodation, housing? What are we going to do about it? So all these will need to be addressed yeah, yep. by the political parties. And I think the opposition must get its uh, job uh, uh, together on this. Mm. And uh, if we do so, then we'll be able to persuade the general electorate to vote for us. And as Mune said just now, we vote for the persons, mm. not, not for the party. We shouldn't vote for the party anymore. Because quite clearly, parties have been failing us. Yeah? Coalitions have been failing us. So let's look beyond it. I'm not saying that coalitions are not important. Okay? For government formation, they still become important. But they must be check and balances, even within uh, the system. So that's where the young, the independents, even I take my Veterans. very off yeah, to use something more yeah, uh, localised. They fought for the country and they deserve to be heard. Uh, generals and the colonels, and they're coming out yep. and making the voice heard uh, on every issue. Yesterday, was it, was it yesterday or today? Patriot has come out with a very strong statement. I mean, these are the things which we, we must support yep. and uh, continue to encourage. Yeah? I, I, and I end on this note because uh, uh, RMC has been mentioned. So many of us here, you know, around the table. <laughs> but just to get our experience and across, there was no racism, no communalism in RMC. Everyone was treated alike. Um, everyone was judged on merits. Everyone wore the same clothes, uh, even down to the same underwear, greed in colour. You know? <laughs> <Everything, laughs> you know? And everyone had to uh, thrive on merit. Yeah, whether you're Chinese, Indian, or Malay, or Kadazan, or whatever, it didn't matter then. And I think that is a system we should try and emulate. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, we acknowledge our differences, but we are Malaysians and we shall rise again. Okay. Thank you, Tan Sri. Okay, I think, um, sorry, it's gone over time so much, but if I could.
conclude, um, I think it's very clear from the panelists, the speakers, that we, all of us Malaysians, ordinary Malaysians, have a very big role to play and not just leave it to the politicians. We, when we demand, when we ask for accountability, they have to listen to us and they have to also change the narrative, but we can help to write that narrative together. So, like uh, it was said by Tan Sri and the rest, um, all is not lost. We have the power to do something constructive, and now is the time, and we can come back stronger. So I hope um, some of you through tonight's engagement might be a little bit inspired or to get engaged with the politicians, Gerak Independent even, do something. That's why Malaysiana LCMS, myself, Leader on Mix, did this, right? So that we can start doing something and not just put our hands up and say, all is lost. Yep. I hope that is the message um, everyone will take away. Um, now, I'm sorry we can't go on. Uh, I see your hand up there. But I have to say thank yous now um, to Tan Sri Arif for writing the book, giving us the opportunity to talk about this. Tan Sri Muni Majid for you know, being the keynote speaker. The panelists, very engaging. Leader on Mix for supporting this. Uh, Saudara Roshan Tiran for bringing his team in. Uh, he's back there, by the way. Sogo for very generously um, allowing us to use the hall, um, especially Ms. Lisa Young and her team. Um, they actually stayed up way beyond their working hours. Uh, they end at 9.30. <laughs> and most of all, to all of you, despite the long hours, it's very late at night, I realise that. But obviously, all of us, regardless of our race, our religion, one thing we have in common, we all love this country. So let's keep on having that good fight and do it together. Thank you. Um, okay. Announcements. Book signing will be immediately after this. Um, this will be moved. A table will be here. Tan Sri will be here. If you've got your books to uh, have him sign, please do come up. Uh, parking validations. If you've not done it, it's at the back, just outside the hall. And exit can be only through the doors at the back. Not here because the shopping centre is already closed. So you have to take the, the lift down either to LG or to basement if your car is parked downstairs. And lastly, if I could uh, request from you all, as I said earlier at the beginning, we need your support to help defray the cost of this event. If you could uh, support us generously, the donation boxes are out there near the exit. Um, Thank you very much, so that we can do more of this next time. Thank you very much. Good night. Eh, Jackie, ah, hmm? You bought the other day, your app, your Nicole. Nicole, you saw what? No, see, I got a good app, yeah, ma. Okay, look at the Nicole, look at. I got a lot of things, just article, podcast, courses, yeah. I got a lot of things. Do I, do I get home yet? Do I home yet? I home yet. Daddy, you I can't read, bro. Hunter,